in areas that had a large English-speaking population, the boycott made national and international news. So we had these demonstrations, I can't remember how many, I think we had them every week, something like that, for, for a period of time. And the crowds kept getting bigger, and of course, there'd be a counter demonstrations, people shouting at us. Um, but it was getting a lot of coverage, and it was raising the issue. You know, the issue, and I kept saying to the journalists in French, is English really something that has to be hidden? Is it something to be ashamed of? And we were clearly winning. In fact, the, the, the companies went to Lucien Bouchard and said they were going to have to cave in because it was so affecting their business. But then there was a, a, a bomb threat at Lyons Quebec. The offices were closed. The building was evacuated, you know, 55-story building that we were in at that time. <clears throat> and, um, and then also Bouchard made a statement uh, saying that this could not be tolerated. They had better continue uh, putting up signs only in French. We were, we were only asking, we weren't asking for the abolition of Bill 101. We were asking for the stores to implement what the law permitted. That is one third in, or one quarter, whatever is one, th uh, you know, twice as much French as all other languages combined, that's all we were asking. Give us that, but that means some English, whereas they were having none. I realized with the election coming and after Bouchard's speech that we couldn't carry this on much longer. Well, what I was proposing is that we go to Toronto, to the head office, and have our last demonstration there, and you know, make a strong statement there. But the executive, where I was, as you know, outnumbered nine to one, the executive was totally dominated by the Liberal Party and they were so afraid of causing problems. So they, they had, on the night before, we had, we had a meeting and they voted uh, that um, they would not uh, pursue this, uh, this uh, function, this demonstration anymore, this action anymore. So the next day at the demonstration, after making a speech on the issues, I said, well, we will no longer be demonstrating. And of course, there was a lot of disappointment, a lot of anger. Um, some people wanted to continue independently, uh, but uh, I felt, you know, I'm bound by what the executive does. I mean, I believe in the rule of law. Bill 101's section on language proficiency tests sunk its teeth into an anesthesiologist who worked at the Children's Hospital. The anesthesiologist who had a working knowledge of French could not pass his French proficiency test in order to continue working in the province. Galganov then organized the rally outside of the language police in protest and to create awareness of the situation. I get a phone call one day from the Children's Hospital, the Montreal Children's Hospital, which is the English equivalent of the Hôpital saint Justin. And they're very upset because an American uh, anesthesiologist uh, was failed for his French proficiency exam, the written part. And this guy spoke French, not well, but more than well enough to communicate with his patients. And anesthesiologists are in very short supply anywhere. But when you're talking about pediatricians, anesthesiologists whose specialty are children, they're rare. This guy is an American who decided that he and his wife decided they wanted to live in a totally different culture. And they came to Quebec and they grasped all of it. It was really, it was a dream for them. But the dream became a nightmare because all of a sudden he can't, he can't get licensed. He is licensed, but he can't have it renewed. So he said, I'm leaving. And they called me up and said, Mr. Galganov, you got to do something. So I said, well, screw them. We're going to go to the Office de la Langue Française en masse and we're going to shut them down. We're going to shut down this racist language police. And they're in the Stock Exchange building in Montreal, or the former Stock Exchange building in old Montreal. Again, I didn't know how many people were going to show up, but it was hundreds, maybe 400 people. Most of them, professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, nurses, teachers. It was an incredible group of people. And all the media, of course, were there. And the police sent out SWAT teams because it was the Stock Exchange building and they thought it might be a, a direct attack on the Office de Langue Francaise. And the bastards locked the elevators. 
they shut down the entire building, which violated every fire code and safety code in the province or the city. They were terrified of us. Terrified of what? Professionals, doctors, accountants, teachers? That's who they were scared of? It was very successful. They turned around, they said the doctor can stay. They, 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 they reviewed the case, but the doctor said, I've had enough. I don't want to be anywhere near you people. And he left. the federal government adopted the Clarity Act based on the Supreme Court reference in 1996. The Clarity Act was legislation that established the condition under which the Government of Canada would enter negotiations that might lead to the secession following such a vote by a province. The Clarity Act stipulated that in order to have separation negotiations, a given province would have to have a clear question, a clear majority, a constitutional amendment, and assets, borders, liabilities, Aboriginal rights, and minority rights are on the table. Which is a matter of record now, and in 1998 we did go to the Supreme Court, and my former professor of constitutional law, Stephen Scott, uh, represented the Equality Party, and we were one of more than a dozen groups who did go to the Supreme Court, and uh, we got the reference case of 98, and that became, of course, Clarity Act. For years, the first people making these arguments in the country were the Equality Party. And the issues that we put in front of the Supreme Court, because I believe it was Equality Party's issues that went in front of the Supreme Court, were all vindicated. Every single one of them. 50% plus one is not enough. We don't know what is. That's left to the political actors, according to the, the decision. Secondly, it does require a constitutional amendment to have Quebec secede from the country. So a lot of people forget they shouldn't. Uh, because if referendum three does pass, the other Canadians can say, I'm sorry, we, we don't agree with that. Too bad, end of story. They have the legal right to do so. The Supreme Court has said so. Legally, it requires a constitutional amendment. And of course, the third thing is the borders of Quebec will be changed if uh, Quebec is allowed to become an independent country. If someone looks at what's happening in Quebec and they're, and they're well informed and they have any sensitivity as to what should be going on here and what other civil societies do to handle their ethnic and linguistic tensions, if the more you know about the situation in Quebec, it is perfectly natural to be angry about it. And in fact, if you're not angry about it, then you've made a compromise that you shouldn't expect other people to make. When I, when I hear people saying, have to keep the country together. And if that means compromising on a few rights, so be it. That's fine, someone can make that decision. But I don't want them to be making it for my clients or myself. It's an accurate description. People were and are angry that their country is being taken away from them. That's normal. Um, people do get angry about such things. So I don't, uh, it's intended as an insult, but I just think of it as a description. I guess when it was first introduced into our vocabulary in Quebec, it would mean someone who's basically Canadian and pissed off, and they're just creating a ruckus for no, absolutely no reason. Where the reality is, at least in my mind, it's an anglophone is, is someone as a Canadian loyalist who uh, sees that there's a lot of inequalities, who enjoys living in Canada, wants to remain part of Canada, and is willing to, uh, to fight for their ideals and principles that they believe are right in, a, in an unjust society. Those who, who just were frustrated by the political process felt uh, disenfranchised. Uh, I think we were a vocal minority, vocal and visible, and I think that's what it sums up. Angrophone. If you're not angry over being treated like a second-class citizen, you're a schmuck. Anyone who's not an angrophone is a schmuck, period. 
anyone anyone who could wake up in the morning and say, well, it's okay that I can't see my language. Oh, it's okay that my kid couldn't get a job in the Quebec Civil Service. Oh, it's okay that I can't I I I can't take a look at government papers in my language, even though I'm paying taxes, my English taxes to the government, and not be angry. I wasn't angry. I was determined. We were presented as extremists. And if there's anything that's clear, the historical record is there, we were with the Supreme Court. We were with the decisions of several courts. And so we were defending a concept of liberal democracy that's accepted in all the major democracies, but not in Quebec. So our problem, we had two problems. One is that in Quebec, there was the elite and there was the people. The people were with us. All the, uh, the opinion polls showed that the people were against the language laws for schools, against the language laws for stores, uh, against uh, all these various uh, ways of restricting English. All the polls showed that, but the elites, meaning the opinion leaders, uh, they were against us. You know the rest of the world thinks you're right. You know the guys south of the border think you're right. Only in your own country are you treated like some kind of uh, kook uh, for standing up for things that everyone else in the world knows uh, is correct. Uh, it takes a special kind of person to have guts to do that. Do you like my posture? Faces back and forth. Keith, we're proud of you, Keith. Thank you. We're very proud of yep. you. And, and even when we're sober, we'll still be proud of you. <laughs> there are very, very interesting terms that we have in uh, Quebec that we don't have in North America. Hey guys, go in the other room. What kind of a country is... No, what? So what? It's ambient noise. Go ahead. Not, not to be critical, but if you're doing a documentary, you want the noise. Yeah, no, but I mean, sometimes, you know what? That might really fix Which makes both languages official in fact. Which they are. Okay, and the problem is that uh, French. I identified with both French and English. You know, I actually cried when I read about how Wolf fooled Montcalm. That's right. <laughs> Sure, I think we just...